boys and girls, children of all ages, freaks and geeks, trolls and derps alike. Welcome, welcome all. I am Mullet Mike with the Paddle Gaming Network and Full Screen, bringing you Season 5 of Creepy Gaming. Well, I knew it was going to happen. You knew it was going to happen. After the success of Five Nights at Freddy's and Five Nights at Freddy's 2, a sequel was inevitable. Inevitable! You knew it was going to happen. It was just a matter of time. So today, we will be gearing up for the new attraction that is Five Nights at Freddy's 3. Special shout out to all these fine folks. I want to thank you all so much for your suggestions. If you have a suggestion for Creepy Gaming, be sure to leave them in the comments below. Pros. We're pros. What can I say? Alright, without any further ado, let's kick this season off. Get your pizza and party hats ready because it's time to turn the lights down and the volume up as we journey into some creepy gaming. Can't stop blinking. Oh, oh. Two thousand and fourteen was a big year for survival horror games. The genre had somewhat of a resurgence with such games like Daylight or The Evil Within, but it wasn't until indie developer Scott Cawthon decided to change the face of fear. If you are unfamiliar with the games, then please refer back to my previous episodes where I cover the first two games as well as theories, easter eggs, and secrets within. Five Nights at Freddy's 3 was released on Steam in early March 2015. The game has already been topping the charts and has received mixed to positive reviews from critics and players alike. Much like the other games, Five Nights at Freddy's 3 takes place in an all new location. Rather than a children's pizza diner, here you are placed in an all new haunted attraction based on the incidents from the previous Fastbear restaurants. Now I've got to admit, I like this approach. I've always enjoyed haunted houses and attractions, so I am happy to see this rather than another restaurant rehash. That's just me though. Okay, now follow me on this one because this is where it starts to get real meta. You now play as an employee of the haunted attraction playing the part of the security guy. With me so far? Great, because if you're not, it's only going to get more convoluted from here. Night one, you receive a phone call, but rather than the typical phone guy that we all know and love, now we get this tubular dude. Hey, hey, glad you came back for another night. I promise it'll be a lot more interesting this time. We found some, some great new relics over the weekend, and we're out tracking down a new lead right now. So, uh, let me just update you real quick, then you can get to work. Like, the attraction opens in like a week, so we have to make sure everything works and nothing catches on fire. Uh, when the place opens, people will come in at the opposite end of the building and work their way toward you and past you and out the exit. Uh, yeah, you've officially become part of the attraction. Uh, you'll be starring as... The security guard! So not only will you be monitoring the people on the camera as they pass through, you know, to make sure no one steals anything or makes out in the corner, but you'll also be a part of the show. It'll make it feel really authentic, I think. Uh, now let me tell you about what's new. We found another set of drawings, always nice, and a foxy head, which we think could be authentic. Then again, it might just be another crappy cosplay. And we found a desk fan, very old school, metal though, Watch the fingers. Uh, uh, right now the place is basically just, you know, flashing lights and spooky props. But I honestly thought we'd have more by now. Uh, if we don't have something really cool by next week, then we may have to suit you up in a furry suit and make you walk around saying, boo. <laughs> uh, but, you know, like I said, 
We're trying to track down a good lead right now. Uh, some guy who helped design one of the buildings, he says it was like an extra room that got boarded up or something like that. So we're going to take a peek and see what we can find. Uh, for now, just get comfortable Hello. with the new setup. Um, you can check the security cameras over to your right with the click of that blue button. Uh, you can toggle between the hall cams and the main Hi. cams. Uh, then over to your far left, uh, you can flip up your maintenance panel. You know, use this to reboot any systems that may go offline. <laughs> so in trying to make the place feel vintage, we may have overdone it a bit. <laughs> Some of this equipment is barely functional. Yeah, I wasn't joking about the fire. That's, that's, that's a real risk. Uh, the most important thing you want to watch for is the ventilation. Look, this place will give you the spooks, man. And if you let that ventilation go offline, then you'll start seeing some crazy stuff, man. Keep that air flowing. Okay, keep an eye on things, and we'll try to have something new for you tomorrow night. There you go. Much like the previous games, the initial phone call gives you all you need to know. It lays out the ground rules, sets the tone, and lets you know what you're in for. Something I thought was noteworthy was that the night one phone call starts out with, Hey, you're back. This only raises more questions. So, are you a new employee? Or have you been there for a while? Maybe you quit and came back. Or maybe you got fired. Well, please refrain from asking any further questions until after the episode. Thank you. Thank you. No, I said no further questions! So the basic game mechanics return from the previous two entries with a few interesting twists. Rather than batteries, flashlights, and doors, you are now given a more modern setup. Maybe that's because Five Nights at Freddy's 3 is an actual sequel, set decades after the events of the previous game. It is said that the haunted attraction you're working at has a lot going on with it. The attraction's electrical system is unstable, and your job is to keep all the systems online. This includes the audio, video, and ventilation systems. So like previous games in the series, this one gives you plenty to juggle with. On the second night, we are introduced to the new breakout star of the series, The Spring Trap. It is revealed by the new phone guy that the haunted house acquired one of the actual animatronics. Unfortunately, it was the notorious Golden Bonnie, dubbed Spring Trap. It's interesting to note that this is actually the only animatronic in the game, technically. Again, note, technically. This doesn't mean you won't see your favorite characters return. Phantom versions of the classic cast are back, but only as hallucinations, or at least ghostly apparitions. Ugh, with all these phantoms running around, there's probably a phantom mullet might too. That, that's not a There better not be a Phantom Mike! I'll admit, when I first heard there was only going to be one animatronic, I was skeptical. But overall, it was executed very well. When the aforementioned ventilation system goes offline, your character begins to black out, causing you to see a moving Phantom Freddy, Chica, Foxy, Mangle, the Puppet, and even Balloon Boy. These animatronics will deliver plenty of jump scares, but won't cause you any harm. Luckily, you can use the audio system to distract and lure Springtrap as long as it stays online. Clicking the audio button cues a Balloon Boy sound effect that will grab the animatronic's attention. He has to be nearby or else he won't hear it. This adds a new gameplay dynamic that I feel adds to the overall experience. Keeping the video system online is self-explanatory. This is strictly for the surveillance system. The major difference regarding the security cameras is now you have two sets to view. There is a typical ground level surveillance as well as a new system dedicated entirely to the ventilation shafts. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute! Why is there a camera system in the events of a haunted attraction? I mean, I get it with Five Nights at Freddy's too. you got Balloon Boy running around and all, but this haunted attraction didn't even own an animatronic until the second or third night. What's really going on here? Why are the cameras? What ventilation system do you know of that needs cameras? The game's difficulty is much more user-friendly than the panic fest that was Five Nights at Freddy's 2. Don't get me wrong though, this game gets difficult enough as the nights roll on. I just feel like the difficulty has been curbed and is a little more balanced than the last. 
The same styles of scares return. We have tension and psychological terror. There is your standard issue jump scares, eerie environments, chilling sound design, but I think most will agree that the true terror in the game lies in the backstory. And let's just say this game actually gives a bit more closure. Completing Five Nights at Freddy's 3 will answer many players' questions, but not before raising a few more. Overall, I've really enjoyed Five Nights at Freddy's 3. The tone was darker, the setting was spooky, and Springtrap was a great nightmare-inducing addition. The game wasn't as difficult or as clustered as the second, the camera layout worked well, the Phantom animatronics ruined what little childhood I had left, and overall, I just had fun playing it. That's what I look for. Oh, come on now, guys. You don't know me very well. Of course, of course I'm going to go over the Easter eggs and secrets. This first part was a spoiler-free section, if you will. That way, if you haven't played it, you still can and enjoy it. But join me in part two, when we will cover Five Nights at Freddy's 3, Secrets, Easter Eggs, and Hidden Meetings. I think that's going to do it for me today, folks. I want to thank you all so much for joining me. I hope you enjoyed. Hi, I'm Mother Mike with a full screen saying, you stay creepy. Thanks for watching. Peace. Boys and girls, children of all ages, freaks and geeks, to rolls and derps alike, welcome, welcome all. I am Mullet Mike, the host of Creepy Gaming, bringing you Creepy Gaming, because I just said I was the host of it. Did you not hear that? Did you hear that? Did you? I know you did. If you joined us last time, we went over a spoiler-free version of Five Nights at Freddy's 3. Now, if you've already seen part one, or if you're unfamiliar, then go back and watch it, because in this episode, we're gonna get down to the juicy stuff. We're gonna talk about secrets, hidden meanings, Easter eggs, theories, and more. Okay, real quick, I should note that this game is still very new, and I am not claiming to make an anthology of Easter eggs, secrets, and theories. So I know there's gonna be ones that I miss, but, if there's one that I missed that you really, 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 really want me to cover, then leave it down in the comments below without any further ado. Turn the lights down and the volume up as we journey into some creepy gaming. It's no secret that a lot of the Five Nights at Freddy's lore is open to interpretation. This is so the players' minds can fill in the gaps. By not laying everything out in the open, set in stone, has allowed everyone to make the story as dark or as light as they want. There's a fine line between teases and payoffs. It's the balance that complements one another. The highest praise I can give Five Nights at Freddy's 3 is that the game balances the two very well. We get just enough closure and payoff to the story, while not getting all of our questions answered, and in some cases raising new questions entirely. We'll talk more about that closure in a few minutes. In the meantime, allow me to share some secrets, theories, and easter eggs from Five Nights at Freddy's 3. Now, I should note, these are not my own personal theories, rather than questions raised by the gaming community. I will be sure to announce if a theory is my own. Speaking of which... In my previous Easter Egg video on Five Nights at Freddy's 1 and 2, I proposed a theory in which the yellow suit that was reportedly taken was not in fact, the Golden Freddy suit, as some may have speculated. Here's a clip of that segment. On night six of Five Nights at Freddy's 2, the phone guy declares that the suit went missing. Someone used one of the suits. We had a spare in the back, a yellow one. Someone used it. The newspaper article says that the killer was dressed as a company mascot. It never says anything about Golden Freddy. I think most people just assume that it is. Called it. It is revealed that Springtrap was in fact the killer. So was the purple guy. 
But that's probably because they are one and the same. Or at least we think. In the end of Five Nights at Freddy's 3, it is revealed that the ghosts of the five children enslave the purple guy into the golden bonnie suit, later being called Springtrap. Now, while I was correct about my golden suit theory, one I got wrong was my thesis of the puppet being the killer. The ending to Five Nights at Freddy's 3 further proved that the spirit of the puppet, or phantom according to the game's files, was in fact the one who helped the ghosts of the missing children pass on. We have only merely scratched the surface. The ending is a whole nother thing. So as most of you probably know by now, Five Nights at Freddy's 3 has at least two endings that we know for sure. If you didn't know exactly what to do on your first playthrough, then most gamers, myself included, were rewarded with the bad ending. For those unaware, there is a series of events that you must complete on each night in order to get the good ending. Triggering each of these will send you to a new section of minigames, very reminiscent of the death minigames from Five Nights at Freddy's 2. Note, these are not the same minigames you play after each night, but rather something totally different. These include Balloon Boy's Air Adventure, Mangle's Quest, Chicka's Party, Stage 01, that's clever, Shadow Bonnie Glitch Game, and Happiest Day. Each minigame has at least two ways of completion. The correct way usually consisting of bringing cake to the dead children. God, this game is dark. If all the games are completed correctly, then you are treated to the good ending, which is pretty much exactly like the other ending. This one just gives you a little more insight. Some players believe that this indicates that the souls of the missing children have been freed. Further proof of this can be seen in the ending screens of the games themselves. The good ending screen plays a peaceful melody as we look at the clearly lifeless heads of the animatronics. Now look at the bad ending screen. Notice the darker, creepier tone, along with the glowing eyes, possibly indicating the souls of the children are still trapped within. You may also notice a fifth pair of glowing eyes that were not seen in the good ending. Who is this supposed to be? Is it Golden Freddy? The puppet? Or is it Springtrap? Forever watching the children. God, this game is dark. One character that I failed to mention in my previous videos was Shadow Bonnie. The reason for this is simple. I've just never encountered him. Sure, I've heard about him, but at the time of the second Five Nights at Freddy's, it was unknown if Shadow Bonnie was really meant to be in the game, a player-made mod, or a mere glitch. After playing Five Nights at Freddy's 3, it is confirmed that Shadow Bonnie is, in fact, a character in the series. Now, I'm not even going to begin to speculate on who or what the character represents. The ensemble cast is already so convoluted. Wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute! So, Bonnie is a ghost version of an already haunted animatronic that is possessed by the ghost of a dead child. Were they haunted before the kids? Wait a minute, or were they just computer programmed? Or was it the bite of 87? Did it have something to do with Golden Freddy? Wow, what the fuck? Okay, so I have some questions. Recently, ScottGames.com released an image teasing the fourth game dubbed The Final Chapter. That being said, I STILL have some questions! Hell, I have even more questions now! The image shows a newly designed Freddy Fazbear tipping his hat. We also see a release date as well as these disturbing Freddy heads. I'm really hoping this next installment gives us some more answers. 
I doubt everything will be revealed, and understandably so, but a lot of loose ends will have to be tied since this is supposed to be the final chapter. So in the meantime, maybe you can help me. If you know the answers to any of these following questions, then let me know in the comments below. I'm sure when the game comes out later this year, I'll be doing a follow-up episode and hopefully covering these then. Okay, I gotta calm myself down before asking these questions. I, I, I don't know if you've noticed, but I tend to get myself a little worked up sometimes when I overthink it. Whew, okay, here we go. And I think you'll find these as valid points, but maybe I missed something. Anyways, okay, I digress. Here's a question. Who is Purple Freddy? Who was the telephone guy? Whatever happened to Mike Schmidt? Was he Springtrap? In a place where cameras are everywhere, was there no evidence? What is the purple guy holding in his hand? Wait, wait, were there two purple guys? Why were, were certain elements not mentioned or referred to in Five Nights at Freddy's 3? No bite of 87? Golden Freddy not predominantly featured? What the fuck is going on around here? <laughs> I gotta quit thinking about this. I gotta stop. I am gonna drive myself crazy trying to wrap my head around all these theories. I don't know and we're not supposed to know. That's the beauty of it. If he answered all of our questions, then yeah, the series is wrapped up. It's done. It's over. But there are so many more places to go. It's definitely wrapped up the main storyline. The kids are uh, freed according to the good ending, so... That part is done, but there's still so much more unanswered. Plus, I'm hearing we got a movie coming up. That's pretty exciting. There is my Five Nights at Freddy's anthology, starting with one to the latest. So, I hope you guys enjoyed. I want to thank you all for watching. I hope you're enjoying Season 5 of Creepy Gaming. Plenty more to come. I think that's going to do it for me today, folks. So, hi, I'm on the mic with a sticky pedal full screen saying, Game is sticky, stay creepy. Thanks for watching. Peace. Hmm. this fucking thing on? Hmm. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, to survive here. What's up, guys? Uh, Why is everything so loud? Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, to survive all ages. Uh, Daddy's got a little bit of a headache today, okay, sweetie? So we're just gonna go ahead and move this right along here. Today we're gonna be talking about Pokemon. Mm. Don't ever drink, kids. Don't ever do it. It's not good for you. Special stick shout out to all these fine folks. Right here, thank you. Thank you for your suggestions and support. If you have a suggestion for creep. Mm. Oh, it's just a warning. It's just a warning. We're okay. We're okay. If you have a suggestion for creepy gaming, then be then be sure to leave them in the comments below. All right. So like I said, we're just gonna kind of get this ball rolling here. Oh, got dizzy. Today we're gonna talk something to do about Pokemon. I don't know. It. I know it's gonna be creepy though. <laughs> So, turn the lights down and the volume up. Or, you know what? Let's just turn the lights down and turn the volume down, too. As we journey into some creepy gaming. If you have seen previous episodes of Creepy Gaming, then you know that we are no stranger to Pokemon games. These cute little Nintendo RPGs aren't always what they seem. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it, I'm just saying that these kid-friendly titles can definitely have a dark side. If anything, I feel like it adds a little depth to the series, similar to the Delta episodes from Pokemon Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire. As I've stated in the past, the Pokemon franchise has been littered with controversy, creepy video game easter eggs, secrets, hidden meanings, and more creepypastas than you could even begin to imagine. 
That being said, I wanted to try something different with this episode. You know, shake things up a bit. You know, an episode could usually be about a scary Easter egg or discussion over strange theories or or something from the creepypasta files. Hell, it could just be a review of a scary-ass game. So now, in addition to all this, I would like to present to you a compilation episode. And let me clarify, this is not a best of or highlights video. This episode will feature all new content. Think of it like a top 10 list, just without numbers, because from what I was told, there would be no math. Now, with that out of the way, let's talk about some creepy Pokemon shit. Let's start with a few Pokedex entries. A little wire won't stick. Now, if you're watching this video, I assume you know what Pokemon is at this point, but like Stan the Manly always says, Excelsior! No, not that, but every comic book is someone's first comic book. Now then, for those who have been living under a rock or in a coma or maybe just recently won a 20-year game of hide-and-seek and don't know, Pokemon is about a boy or girl trainer depending on what gender you choose, who goes out on a journey to catch, battle, and befriend these cute little creatures called Pokemon. The name Pokemon actually derives from the term Pocket Monsters. So, so wait, so wait, the game's already admitting they're monsters. Well, we're just off to a great start now, aren't we? The ultimate goal of the game is to catch them all and grow into the greatest trainer of the region. At the beginning of every game, you will run into a professor who will give you your first Pokemon and Pokedex. The Pokedex is essentially a Pokemon encyclopedia with all the creature's essential info. The Pokedex will also give you a brief summary about the monster itself. Some Pokemon have happy, cutesy little Pokedex entries, others not so much. Let's talk about those. These entries are the ones that make you go, WHAT IN THE FLYING FUCK WERE THEY THINKING PUTTING THIS IN A GAME INTENDED FOR CHILDREN?! Now, there are many different entries that can be morbid or just downright creepy. But for the sake of irony, today we will be covering Pokemon that just seem to have a thing against the game's target audience. Kids. Take the Dust Skull, for example. In Pokemon Platinum, Black, White, and Black and White 2, Dust Skull's Pokedex entry reads as follows. It loves the crying of children. It startles bad kids by passing through the walls and making them cry. In Pokemon Sapphire and Alpha Sapphire, the entry states, Duskull wanders lost among the deep darkness of midnight. If this doesn't sound like a creepy child-stalking monster, then I don't know what does! You can tell the underlining theme here is simply an Eastern retelling of the Boogeyman who frightens children who have been misbehaving. That's not even the weirdest entry of the bunch, though. Oh no. No, no. No, 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 no. That's nothing compared to the others out there. Take Bayonet, for example. In almost every Pokemon game it has appeared in, its entry essentially paraphrases the following. A doll that became a Pokemon over its grudge of being thrown away. It seeks the child who disowned it. So here we have a Pokemon that came to be because some child got tired of playing with it when it was a doll, mind you, abandoned it, only for it to come back as a monster and search for the child that disowned it. I don't even want to know what it does if it finds the kid. Maybe it thanks the child for getting rid of it so it can go live a normal life as Bayonet Pokemon do, of course. <sighs> Who am I kidding? I'm just trying to be optimistic here. <laughs> but you think that's bad? No, no. That's nothing. That's kitty shit. Pun very much intended. There's also that one Pokemon. What's his face? He who shall not be named. That's what I'll call him. Because I ain't talking about him. I refuse. He scares the shit out of me. How about Phantom? 
In Pokemon Y and Alpha Sapphire, its Pokedex entry reads, According to old tales, these Pokemon are stumps possessed by the spirits of children who died while lost in the forest. So here, they're just straight up stating that these Pokemon are dead children. Wow. Just, just wow. <laughs> hey, applause for Game Freak here. Because only Game Freak can make children dying and possessing rotten tree stumps seem like a completely normal thing. In all likeliness, this could be in reference to the Kadama, of course, also from Japanese folklore, or even the Aoki Gahara Jukai, also known as the Suicide Woods. Damn, this is getting dark quick. I've had better days. Oh, oh God. I doubt it. Oh, God. Moving on from these disturbing Pokedex entries, let's talk about some other strange Easter eggs theories and creepypastas. In a previous episode, we covered the controversial LTS, or also known as Lavender Town Syndrome. Please feel free to go back and watch that episode to hear my thoughts. We've also covered the infamous Ghost Girls from the latest generation of Pokemon games, just recently as a matter of fact. To catch up on those who are unaware, there is a strange hex maniac ghost girl in Pokemon Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire, as well as X and Y. She's probably best known from her appearance in Lumwa City in X and Y. When the screen fades in and out, she floats around you and says, no, you are not the one. Although, some people still claim that she'll say to them, you are the one I've been looking for. Am I repeating myself? I feel like I'm repeating myself. Anyway, moving on. I recently found out that if you go to the fourth floor of the Hotel Rishima... I recently found out if you go to the fourth floor of the Hotel Rishishima, you will run into the same woman. This time, she will say, don't talk to me. If you do, I won't hear the elevator. This may be in reference to the first game when you meet her on the second floor near the elevator. And thanks to my buddy, the gamer from Mars, who I've collaborated with before, informed me that if you go behind the schedule board of the Lumwa City Station, you will discover a note that reads, I am going to go for help. Wait for me in the usual place. This leads many to theorize that this mysterious note must be in some way related to the ghost girl. <sighs> Just a little... Just take a little nap your poo there. What is it with all these ghost girls? Now that we've addressed some disturbing Pokedex entries, creepy Easter eggs, and a theory or two, Let's briefly discuss a few Pokemon creepypastas. As forementioned, I've already talked about Lavender Town Syndrome, so let's start with one I've gotten a ton of requests for, Pokemon Strangled Red. This story is about a guy who finds a red Pokemon cartridge. He played the blue version growing up, so he wanted to see the difference between the two. When starting the game, the strange title screen said, Pokemon Strangled Red. Well, guess what? Wouldn't you know it? Weird shit happens. While playing, he then goes to his legit rival's house in Pallet Town. There, he encounters a character named Red. And let me just tell you from personal experience, a character in a creepypasta named Red can't be a good sign. Red simply states that he'd be the best when it was his turn. The player uses his favorite, Miki, his Charizard, throughout the rest of the game. 
He eventually beats it, but rather than the typical Pokemon endings, he got something totally different. At this point, the red cartridge was either some kind of hack or something really weird was happening. After what should have been the ending, his character and his brother in the game decide to trade Pokemon. His brother wants Miki, his favorite Charizard. The player selects no, but the game does not recognize it, forcing him to trade his favorite Pokemon. While trading, the game crashes and creepypasta chaos ensues. I won't give it all away, but it's a must read for any creepypasta fan who loves Pokemon. It's an older story, but a goodie. I like the older ones, I guess. I've, I've tend to refer to these now as the classics, or the originals, if you will. Another older story would be Pokemon Creepy Black. It was great for its time. It centers around a trainer and his particular ghost Pokemon. The story shares a few similarities with another classic, Ben Drowned. It also has a really good ending that I'm not going to spoil. It's a good read, or hell, you can play these creepy pastas now. I'm pretty sure there's ROM hacks for Strangled Red, Creepy Black, Lost Silver, Shitty Sapphire, Cummy White Pearl, whatever the hell else. You can find them. They're out there. If I had to give any other suggestions to my creepypasta viewers, then I'd suggest Nurse Joy, Adino's Revenge, and of course, Lost Silver. As I've said many times before, and I'm sure I'll say it many times again, the creepy factor to a kid's game just makes it that much more eerie. Everybody say it with me now. The creepy factor to a kid's game just makes it that much more eerie. But in its defense, as I stated earlier, I feel as if it has added yet another layer to an already deep franchise. Pokemon has found its core buried within creepy gaming history. With its weird easter eggs, intriguing theories, bizarre ghost girls, and numerous creepypastas. Yeah, I'd say it takes the cake. It's so bad. It's just not stopping. <laughs> I'm never gonna drink again. Yep, I think that about does it. I can't possibly think of another Pokemon creepypasta out there that scared the holy living fuck out of me. Nope, not a clue. Nothing really comes to mind. Besides, got this headache. Ugh, you know, just not today. Fortunately, or unfortunately for him, an infamous Pokemon decides to pay him a visit. What secrets lie in store on this edition of Creepy Game? I've had better days. By far, the one Pokemon aspect that has ever really truly creeped me the fuck out is Hypno. That's it. I'm not gonna bury the lead. This some bitch is scary as fuck. I purposely left him off the list in my previous video because to me, this guy deserves his own episode. More on my personal phobia a little later on, but first, like always, let's start from the beginning. This is Hypno. He is a psychic type humanoid Pokemon, number 097 in the Pokedex. They evolve from drowsies and are considered by many as one of the most disturbing Pokemon for a number of reasons. Mainly due to Hypno's controversial anime episode appearance and his disturbing Pokedex entries. Hypno has yellow skin, feline-like features, and is known for carrying a pendulum that it uses to hypnotize its victims. Hence the name. Get it! As I just mentioned, Hypno was featured in a controversial episode of the Pokemon anime entitled Hypno's Nap Time. In the episode, a club of Pokemon lovers were using Hypno and Drowsy to help them with their recent sleep disorder. 
The sleep waves from Hypno were so strong that they started causing kids to act like Pokemon. What is it with the kids? Why children? Ugh. It could be adults and be just as creepy, but considering Hypno's power over children, it just takes it to a darker place, you know? Oh, but wait. A lot of Hypno's Pokedex entries are... interesting, to say the least. But none creepier than in Pokemon Fire Red and Pokemon X. The creature's entry reads as such. It carries a pendulum-like device. There was once an incident in which it took away a child it hypnotized. What the fuck, Nintendo? What the fuck, Game Freak? What the fuck, Japan? And would you believe me if I told you it's about to get stranger? Well, of course you would! This is creepy gaming, after all. Get this, in Pokemon Fire Red and Leaf Green, while wandering around in a berry forest, you will encounter a little girl. If you talk to her, you will learn that she is being terrorized by a quote-unquote scary Pokemon. After which, a Hypno will pop out and attack you, prompting a Pokemon battle. Now, while the game isn't exactly spelling it out for us, I do I do think it's a strong indication that Hypno kidnapped this little girl. May I remind you again that it was in this very game's Pokédex, noting how there was once an incident that it took away a child it hypnotized. Come on now, how did this slip by? Oh, oh, but it does get worse. Wouldn't you have guessed it? There's a Pokémon creepypasta entitled Hypno's Lullaby. Great! So you know what that means, kitties! That's right! Mullet Mike presents to you Creepypasta Time! <laughs> creepypasta Time now? I don't know what I do, Creepypasta Time. Okay, kitties, sit around. Everybody sit around. Let's let's talk about uh, hip, Hypno, is it? Is it Hypno? So Hypno is a bad guy. And this has been Creepypasta Time, brought to you by Mullet Mike. To sum things up rather quickly, it's about Hypno preying on young children. The scariest aspect that came from the creepypasta had to be the lullaby itself, set to the Lavender Town theme, no less. So, while I go get some aspirin and orange juice, I'm gonna play for you guys the lullaby in its entirety. This was anonymously uploaded to the internet, so its true origins are unknown. I do have to give fair warning, some people swear up and down that they are affected by the lullaby when they try to sleep, so please, listen at your own risk. Come little children, come with me, safe and happy you will be, away from home now let us run, with you know you will have so much fun. Oh, little children, please don't cry. Hypno wouldn't hurt a fly. Be free to frolic, free to play. Come with me to my cave to stay. Oh, little children, please don't squirm. These ropes I know will hold you firm. Follow to me the pains and calls. Back and forth your eyelids fall Oh, little children, you cannot leave For you, your families will grieve Minds unraveling at the seams Allowing me to haunt their dreams Do not wail and do not weep It's time for you to go to sleep Little children, you were not clever. Now you'll stay with me forever. Forever, forever. Well, now that we all have enough nightmare fuel to last us the rest of our lives, that's probably going to do it for me today. 
I got heartburn and I need to sleep this off. But before I go, I have to share a quick personal story. Again, this is where I'd usually wrap up and say Hypno will go down in creepy gaming history, yada yada yada. But I think my story will sum up the eeriness of Hypno quite well. While working on this project, I had been staying up late at night, writing, researching wikis and Pokedex entries, and stumbled on to the anonymously recorded lullaby. I listened to it and legitimately got freaked out. And if you know me, if you know the show, then you know I don't say that about everything, especially creepypastas. This is no shit. When I finally fell asleep that night, I dreamt of Hypno. And he was no cartoon character as portrayed in today's episode. He was a beast. In my dream, we were on a stone spiral staircase of what seemed like a brick tower. I was a few stories above him, but behind him stood a line of six children, dazed, hypnotized, blindly following him in a single file line. Hypno, with pendulum in hand, stopped, as did the children. I remember being terribly frightened in my dream, frozen in fear. The next thing I know is Hypno made eye contact with me. And that was it. I woke up from the nightmare, set up in bed very quickly in a cold, cold sweat. <sighs> Just thinking about it now isn't helping my headache any. In all seriousness, believe me if you want, personally, I don't care. And don't get me wrong, I am in no way saying this was a paranormal thing. I'm sure me researching and listening to the song right before I went to bed didn't help any. But, in the same breath, I can say the song did affect me in one way or another. Maybe in a paranormal way, maybe not. Who am I to judge? Either way, I had that dream. And I will never forget it. Well, you did for me, Dickies. Well, thank y'all for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. I'm on my list of Pelsen and Keep Sleepies. Alright, good episode, guys. Who wants a beer? You look like you're ready for a beer, my Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, freaks and geeks, trolls and dirts alike, welcome, welcome all, I am Mullet Mike with the S*** Paddle Gaming Network and Full Screen, bringing you Creepy Gaming. That's right folks, this is the show where we take a look at all kinds of creepy video game easter eggs, creepy pastas, secrets, hidden meanings, hell it could be even a scary video game review. You just don't know. In the same vein of last year, I am here once again live at SGC! <laughs> SGC is also known as one of the biggest parties in gaming. We'll just have to see about that. So in the spirit of SGC, we're actually going to be taking a look at none other than Mario EXE. All right, folks, so without any further ado, turn the lights down and the volume up as we journey into some creepy gaming. All right, y'all enjoy the episode. I'm going to go hang out at SGC. Here, take this. Right. Um... I guess this camera's mine now. E-X-E. -E. These three little letters haunt me in my sleep. Not because of their creepy nature, but that there are just so damn many EXE stories and games out there! Most gaming creepypastas just tend to find one of our childhood favorite classics and just slap a dot .exe at the end of it. After three years of creepy gaming, I have read and played many. 
There's Sonic EXE, Sally EXE, Doom EXE, Toy Story EXE, Cliche EXE, Don't Play EXE, and the list goes on and on. Now, I'm not about to go back into my thoughts on these titles. If you're familiar with the show, then you guys already know by now. But, I have a lot of viewers who enjoy creepypasta games, so I'm doing this one for you guys. There's always something about SGC that brings back a sense of nostalgia. It brings back memories of games of my childhood. So why don't we just ruin that and play Mario EXE? I guess this camera's mine now. I have, I don't know who, I don't know who that guy was. Oh, I'm sorry, man. I'm sorry. I almost I almost killed a lady. Well, this is my this camera's mine now. We're gonna go on an adventure. Here's SDC. Growing up in my generation, who didn't play Super Mario Brothers? The Mario Duck Hunt cartridge came with every system, so it wasn't exactly like it was hard to find. The platforming was great, the music was fun, the controls were tight, and the game was just challenging enough. Now, as much as I enjoy playing a good old-fashioned retro game or two, I also like to try out new things. You know, play games I wouldn't normally play. For example, last year's SGC episode, rather than playing a Mario classic, I opted for Hotel Mario in the 13th Hotel. Okay, I didn't say trying out new games was always a good idea. Not in that case, anyways. Well, this is my this camera's mine now. We're gonna go on an adventure. Here's STC. Here's Mountain Dew. Hey, wait a minute! Wait a minute! Wait a minute! Wait a minute! Wait, 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 wait. Now, I should note there are many Mario EXE creepy pastas. This is not I Hate You, which is also sometimes called Mario EXE, but a different story entirely. This game was sent to me through the Paddle's business email. I noticed the game was sent via mass email to several other YouTubers, including Markiplier and Mudahar from Some Ordinary Gamers. So I'm guessing whoever created the game did a really good job of getting it out there. Mario EXE is based off the 1985 classic Super Mario Bros. I really don't need to say much about it. It's a staple in video game history, one of the most highly regarded Nintendo titles, and the brainchild of the godfather of gaming himself, Shigeru Miyamoto. Oh, here it comes. Sorry, I can't help it. You mention the man's name and angels sing. When starting Mario EXE, you see the familiar title screen of Super Mario Bros. You'll immediately notice that you can't select the first slot. You can only play as Luigi. Once selected, the screen flashes for a split second. No, hold on, hold on, hey, give it, hey, hey. In the blink of an eye, you will see plenty of blood, guts, gore, and an evil looking Mario. The copyright has changed to 666, much like Sonic EXE. Player 1 now says Immortal, and Player 2 states he must die. The score also changed to God, with the numbers 5403. Oh yeah, time now says kill. So does Satan, the almighty demon, have nothing better to do with his time than to develop free-to-play EXE games? I mean, really? Is there really no bigger fish to fry for this guy? You start on what appears to be the first level of Super Mario Bros. It's a pretty faithful recreation. Players will immediately notice, though, that you can't hit coin blocks and enemies are pretty much non-existent. This is what you see when you eventually reach the flagpole. <laughs> <laughs> As you 
as you may have noticed, the screen goes to extreme close-up and Luigi gets impaled by falling spikes. I won't lie, the close-up threw me off. Not in a creepy way, I just thought, well, that was it. That was the game. I tried to close out the game, but I couldn't. I kept trying to hit the escape key, but nothing happened. So I decided to continue on, thinking maybe something would be different this time. Maybe there would be something else at the end of the flagpole. Nope. And I'm sorry, is that the sound effect from the bionic woman and the six million dollar man? Well, my dumbass eventually finds the run key and realizes that when it goes to close up that I could move. Who would have thunk it? So finally, after figuring that out, Luigi outruns the spikes and enters the green pipe, only to get this message. Hello, Luigi. I want to play with you. Huh. This sounds awfully familiar. Stage 1-2 starts out like your traditional Super Mario underground level. Well, except maybe besides the dismembered toads. I don't really recall that from the original series. While moving to the right, I noticed Evil Mario above me, past me, very quickly, almost like he was just toying with me. Next thing I know, there's nowhere to go but down. Luckily, it wasn't just a cheap death. There was a platform. I noticed a mushroom, and even though I know of the poisonous mushrooms from Mario the Lost Levels, I don't know. In a Mario game, when you see a mushroom, you eat it! Well, when eaten, Luigi throws up blood, which is never a good sign, and kills over. And then that's when it hit me. This isn't just a creepypasta EXE game. This is totally a troll game, and anyone who's played Cat Mario knows exactly what I'm talking about. It's... it's... AWESOME! The game is full of beginner's traps, and rather than live and learn, it's more like die and learn. I hate to use this reference, but it's like Five Nights at Freddy's where you just keep failing until you finally catch on. The more you play, the more you learn, the more you progress. Mario EXE is a very rewarding experience, thus causing it to be one of the better EXE games I've played. But that is just my opinion. <sighs> Nervous Nick is fast. To say Mario EXE is cliched is really turned into a cliche in and of itself. Cool Rash developed a game that falls in line with other creepypastas, but unlike any other EXE game I've ever played. Rather than just walking into death traps like its predecessors, Mario EXE actually involves skill and is rewarding when you finish it. Almost like it's trying to be a real game or something. Not just that, but Mario EXE has some pretty good humor on it. And if you watch my show enough, then you know my theory of how horror and comedy really go hand in hand. I mean, I never dreamed of seeing the sprites of my youth puke up blood and die, or fall from a great height and shattering into a million pieces like a Mortal Kombat fatality. This game had me laughing more than it did scare me. And that's because it's a parody. A really good one, I might add. And that's what I appreciate about this game. Rather than just recycling for the sake of recycling, it was recycled, and then there's all these layers added to it. It's great! And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that it's not creepy, because it is. I never expected to see Sam I.L. in a Super Mario Bros. setting. Overall, well done, Cool Rash. I'm looking forward to anything you got lined up in the future. Now, I'm not going to cover the rest of the game. You've pretty much seen it all throughout the gameplay in this video anyways. I just don't want to give away all the beginner's traps. Half of the fun is figuring it out yourself. But I will leave a safe virus-free link in the description below if you think you're brave enough. And I tell you what, just let me know in the comments and maybe I'll do a creepy gaming extra down the road sometime where I play through it and show all the pro tips. But you gotta let me know. 
Other than that, Mario EXE is pretty damn good. Go check it out for yourself. I want to thank you all for watching, and in all seriousness, I would like to thank Nervous Nick. I would like to thank everybody at Screw Attack and Full Screen for putting on one really nice shindig. This has been a fun time, folks. I want to thank you all so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed. I am Mullet Mike out on Full Screen saying, stay creepy. Thanks for watching. Peace. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, freaks and geeks, to rolls and derps alike, welcome, welcome all. I am Mullet Mike with the S Paddle Gaming Network, bringing you Creepy Gaming. For just a little over a year now, we were graced with a strange game that mysteriously popped up unannounced on the PlayStation Store. One day it just showed up. And then much later, just as mysteriously as it appeared, the same game was taken down. This strange title was simply known as P.T. The game put players in a house full of nightmares, including but not limited to a home left in shambles complete with eerie sound design, countless cockroaches, the ghostly apparition of a woman, a brown paper bag with some sort of talking human organ, and yes, you heard that correctly, and a malformed fetus in the sink of the bathroom. Now, out of context, I'm sure it sounds strange, and it was but very eerie and entertaining as well. Now, the game is no longer available for download on the PSN, but those fortunate enough to still have it installed on their PS4 can play it any time. Luckily, I am one of those few. So today, we will be talking about the backstory behind PT and the upcoming spiritual successor, Allison Road. <laughs> When P.T. first appeared, players didn't know what to expect. Your character is stuck in this hellish house with no means of escape. Players must decipher various puzzles to solve the mysteries of what we assume is our character's dark past. If you were lucky enough to finish the cryptic final puzzle, then you were treated with the big reveal that this was part of the Silent Hill franchise and that PT actually stood for Playable Teaser. Not only that, but it appeared to be a sequel entitled Silent Hills, featuring Norman Reedus playing the main character, additional story elements from filmmaker Guillermo del Toro, and get this, the project was to be headed up by none other than Hideo Kojima. Everyone went crazy for the news, myself included. Here you have the unholy trinity of talent working on rebooting my favorite horror franchise. For once, I don't recall there to be any negative feedback on the internet regarding its announcement. And we all know how strange that is. I mean, sure, there probably was a gripe here or there, but for the most part, the internet actually banded together and said, Hell yes, in harmony.
So what happened? Why didn't this magnificently terrifying game ever come to be? Well, for those who don't really follow the video game industry, Metal Gear creator and lead developer Hideo Kojima and the company who holds the rights to Silent Hill Konami officially parted ways in early 2015. It was inevitable. A few months later, the Silent Hills project was cancelled. It was announced PT would be removed from the PlayStation Store, and even Guillermo del Toro was recently quoted saying that he would never work on a video game again. So, not looking too good for the Silent Hill franchise. Fans of the series, like myself, were heartbroken. Personally speaking, I saw more potential and originality in PT than I have in any recent horror title, and that's including the Five Nights at Freddy's series. I was reminded of what psychological terror was all about. The atmosphere of PT, the first person perspective, the original setting, plus the feeling of losing your mind all added to the psychological thrill. Unfortunately, word went quiet. No more talk of PT or Silent Hill. That is, until a few indie developers had something to say about it. I recently began hearing rumblings about a new game being developed in the same vein of PT. The footage you're seeing right now is actually alpha gameplay of an upcoming indie game entitled Allison Road. Even though it's not being published by Konami or falling under the Silent Hill banner, Allison Road developers have been quoted as calling it the spiritual successor to PT. And you can tell by the looks of it. The near 14 minute prototype gameplay can be seen in its entirety on their YouTube channel. I'll be sure to link it down below. But for now, I'll just give my initial impressions. For starters, rather than just flat out ripping off PT, you can tell the developers were more or less inspired by the game rather than just trying to capitalize on its failure. Allison Road looks to me more like it's paying homage to PT while being its own original story. During the prototype gameplay, you can see a number of changes. There is a totally new original setting and score, there are more interactable objects, and you also hear the inner monologue of your character, which to me always works well for storytelling purposes. The gameplay shows a lot of creepiness too, ranging from strange demonic voices to unexplained markings to bleeding walls and even to a female apparition that the developers have since called Lily. Now isn't she a beauty? All I have to say about what I've seen so far is yes! 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 More please! Thank you! Where do I get my money? Take my money! This game looks awesome. I can't wait to get my hands on it myself. Even though it doesn't carry the Silent Hill name, I've realized that it doesn't have to. It has the same spirit, and that is what is really important. And who knows, maybe this Allison Road will lead to its own franchise of scary sequels. Either way, I commend Chris Kessler and the team at Lilith Limited. These guys are fans just like the rest of us. And rather than dream and wonder of what possibly could have been with the now collapsed Silent Hills, they're filling the void, and we now at least will be able to play a spiritual successor and enjoy a whole new creepy gaming experience. The game is scheduled to be released sometime in 2016. Until then, the only game we'll be playing is the waiting game. 
I think that's going to do it for me today, folks. I want to thank you all so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed. I am Mullet Mike with the Metal Gaming Network saying, Stay creepy. Thanks for watching. Peace. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, freaks and geeks, trolls and derps alike, welcome. Welcome all. I am Mullet Mike bringing you Creepy Gaming. That's right, folks. Today we got a special episode for you. Today I'm going to delve into the theory category of the filing cabinet in which we will be talking about the Squall is Dead theory from Final Fantasy VIII. I want to thank everybody who suggested this special shout out to all of these fine folks. I want to thank you all so much for your suggestions. If you have a suggestion for Creepy Gaming, then be sure to leave them in the comments below. Alright, not much to get into the way of today's episode, so we're just going to dig right in. Turn the lights down and the volume up as we journey into some creepy gaming. Think what you want, but reality isn't so kind. Although it can be said that there is a very fine line between fantasy and reality. When I think of the word fantasy, one thing comes to mind. Final Fantasy. Nothing says JRPG to me like the Final Fantasy games. The series lets players enjoy empowering journeys and fantastical settings. The Final Fantasy games have evolved over time just like anything else. Once starting as a developer's last ditch effort, the series has evolved from 8-bit sprites to the visually stimulating epic that it is today. The games are innocent and harmless enough for the most part. Sure the series goes dark in a few places and at times goes a little too over western audiences heads. But overall, there's not that much creepiness to it. Well, unless you want to discuss the eerie theory of Final Fantasy VIII. Following up one of the series' favorites, Final Fantasy VII, developers knew that they had big shoes to fill. But rather than trying to top the emotional roller coaster that was Final Fantasy VII, the sequel had to take a different direction. What we got was one of the weirdest, most bizarre, creepiest entries to date. Released in 1999 for the PlayStation, Final Fantasy VIII silenced most skeptics and received critical praise. Although to say the game got a mixed response from players is an understatement from hell. This fantasy follows the adventures of Squall, Renoa, and company. Patient, persistent players who finished the multi-disc game were met with a surprise that they weren't really expecting. Thus sparking a theory that has continued to be debated to this very day. We're about to go in-depth with this title, so consider this a spoiler alert. Squall Lionheart is the lead protagonist. His name is actually a play on the words Lionheart, meaning one with much spirit. Following fan favorite Cloud from Final Fantasy VII, Square decided to make their new lead character tough with little to say. It is theorized that Squall actually dies at the end of the first disc, and the rest of the game is his dying visions. 
Now, whether a dream, hallucination, or dare I say, fantasy, this vision can be considered his life flashing before his very eyes. It seems as if Squall begins to explore the questions that were raised in the first part of his journey. The theory goes as such. At the end of Disc 1, Squall and his party face the sorceress Adia. After a hard-fought battle, she conjures an ice shard and sends it directly through Squall's chest, causing him to stumble back and fall off of the platform. He sees Renoa above, reaching out to him as he falls. Squall closes his eyes and begins his journey through death. Now that we have the accusation, we will go over the evidence to support such a disturbing theory in this non-horror title. When starting the second disc, Squall awakes from unconsciousness, something that happens quite a bit in this game, actually. He wakes up in a Galbadian desert prison. The first thing he says is, Where am I? I challenged Adia. My wound. No wound. How? After this, I can't recall Squall or his party members reference this event again. Not even once. Most players seem to assume that Adia healed Squall to full health for the purpose of interrogation, but why? He knows very little top secret information than the others at Seed may know. And you gotta remember, at this time, Squall was just a mere rookie. I've also heard people use the Phoenix Down debate. But we've learned from Final Fantasy V and VII that a phoenix down won't always revive the dead. Don't make me remind you of this heartbreaking scene. Enough of that. Another potential piece of evidence is the substantial change in the game's tone. For the most part, Disc 1 is more realistic and down to earth. Well, as realistic as a Final Fantasy game can be, anyway. Disc 2 is where it gets weird. Durr. Weirder. It gets weirder. The game becomes even more fantastical and clashes with the tone that was set at the beginning. Not just that, but the title begins to center more around Squall personally rather than his party in general. This could be further proof that Squall is experiencing some form of wish fulfillment. Remember how I said earlier about Squall raising a lot of questions regarding his life in Disc 1 and how they get resolved after his supposed death. Moving on, the character Cypher is your rival. This was established at the beginning of the game's opening cutscene as we see the two battle, but they have a mutual respect for one another. Renoa, who is the female lead, has feelings for Cypher, creating an awkward love triangle between the three as Squall has feelings for her. This changes from Disc 2 onward. After Squall's supposed death, Cypher is full on heel, and now Renoa, who didn't really care for Squall in the first place, suddenly now has feelings for him. I know Final Fantasy games can be somewhat convoluted at times, but do you see what I'm getting at here? Elements in the story have been completely changed within the first quarter of the game. If Squall really is dead at this point, this would explain the sudden shift in the game's dynamic. While dying, Squall sees what he wants to see. From his romance with Renoa, to Cypher suddenly becoming an asshole, to Squall rising up the ranks as a seed rookie to the leader. All of this may indicate that Squall, in his dying dream, is seeing what he wishes would have happened. Now, I know I've already spoiled a lot, but major spoiler alert, because now we are about to talk about the game's ending. We good? Alright, this is where it gets even creepier. 
When you are getting close to defeating the game's final boss, Ultimisha begins speaking in what seems like just random sentences. But when they are placed together, it creates a foreboding monologue that may further prove that Squall is dead. Now, this is creepy gaming after all, and I'm sure a few of you are thinking, okay, this is an interesting theory and all, but what's so creepy about it? Well, you're about to see. I am now about to show you the ending cutscene from Final Fantasy VIII. And you tell me what you think. We see Squall alone in a dark place. We then see flashbacks to the ballroom scene earlier in the game. Renoa's face eerily begins to shift and distort as if Squall's memory is slowly fading. The screen then whites out, signifying Squall has finally died. As the clip ends, you will see the feather that was floating from the very beginning finally fall. 
We get a lot of quick shots and clips. You probably noticed it, but if you slow down the footage, you will see this notoriously familiar, disturbing image. Does this represent the death of Squall Landhart? Or perhaps the emptiness he feels as if there is a void in his life? Now, I know I'm probably looking into this way too much, but if people can dissect the simplistic by comparison Five Nights at Freddy series, then can you imagine how deep one can look into a 60 plus hour game? And people have done it! There are entire websites dedicated to this theory. I have merely touched the tip of the iceberg. There is much more out there to back these claims. There's even a theory about Renoa possibly being Ultimisha, but I'm not even going to get into that. If you want to read more on the Squall is Dead theory, then feel free to check out the sites below to see the numerous arguments made to further prove this disturbing theory. I remember playing the game when it first came out over 16 years ago, which is just mind-blowing in and of itself. And here we are, still talking about Final Fantasy VIII to this very day. So again, how do you follow the insanely successful Final Fantasy VII? Well, I would say do exactly what Square did at the time. Make a great game with an intriguing story that makes this strange theory plausible. I don't know if it was planned ahead of time or not, but it has definitely added a mystique to an otherwise possibly overlooked game. As I've said before, I've played Final Fantasy VIII when it first came out, and I guess I didn't notice the possibility. I remember when starting the second disc, I was like, huh, well, that was weird. But there was just so much to the story, I didn't think Squall was dead. I recently played through a second time, now knowing of the theory, and my mind was blown. I could totally see it. So much added up to support the Squall is dead theory. But that's just my opinion. We're all entitled to one. So what is yours? Do you believe in the thought of playing most of the game as a dead squall? Or is this just some overblown, overthought, overhyped theory? Let me know in the comments below. Because if squall isn't dead, I would love to know what the fuck the ending means. If you have access to it and you have the time, give it a playthrough. Check it out for yourself. Because of the possibilities, the eerie ending, and the creepy faceless squall, I would say Final Fantasy VIII has done more than enough to earn its place in creepy gaming history, regardless whether or not the theory is true. To me personally, what could be more fitting than for this game to really be Squall's final fantasy?
So was this intentionally put into the game by Squaresoft? Is Squall really dead? Or is this just some fan-made theory that has just kind of grew in hype over the years? I would love to know your thoughts on the Squall is dead theory in the comments below. Other than that, I think that's going to do it for today, folks. So I want to thank you all so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed. Hi, I'm Molly Mike with a hell on full screen saying keep stay creepy. Thanks for watching. Wait for it. Peace. I regret to inform you that I have no intention of selling Metal Gear. As I said, I came to take it back. Oh. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, this is obviously not going to work. What the hell was I thinking? Mullet Mike here with the <laughs> Paddle Gaming Network, bringing you Creepy Gaming. Today, we're talking about Metal Gear Solid 2, The Sons of Liberty. I'm going to try to refrain myself from saying too much about it and just let the video do the talking for itself. Without any further ado, turn the lights down and the volume up as we journey into some creepy. In 2001, Metal Gear fans finally got the sequel that they had been waiting for. Sure, there were the VR missions, but again, players dismissed this game. It had more of the stealth elements that we loved from the first, but lacked the driving storylines we grew accustomed to. Either way, we were given a true follow-up, Metal Gear Solid 2 Sons of Liberty. It should be noted that the game carried on the solid suffix rather than being called Metal Gear whatever, the title kept the solid, thus solidifying the new series. <sighs> and I swear that terrible pun was not intended. The story follows Solid Snake along with fellow clone brothers Liquid and Solidus years after the Shadow Moses incident from the previous game. Explaining the entire game's plot in a few minutes would be like trying to teach Helen Keller how to ride a bike in less than an hour. So to sum it up nicely, Snake finds out that one of his arch enemies, Ocelot, replaced his missing hand with Liquid Snakes, and that Liquid is slowly taking over Ocelot's body. We also find out that Metal Gear specs have gotten out all over the world, and that even the Marines have created their own, codenamed Metal Gear Ray. We are also introduced to a few new characters, namely Raiden, which you might know from Metal Gear Solid 4 and his own game, Metal Gear Rising. This is where the complaints come in. The game is broke up into two chapters, the Tanker and Plant. The Tanker chapter is great. You play a snake in classic Metal Gear Solid fashion, but the problem is that chapter is only about a fourth of the game. The plant chapter surrounds Raiden, a new recruit that is being trained to follow in the footsteps of Snake, on a mission from who we believe to be Colonel Roy Campbell, and I hate to break it to anyone who doesn't know, but you do not play a snake for the rest of the game. Overall, the game was critically praised, but some fans, myself included, were disappointed that Snake was relegated to a simple supporting role. And don't get me wrong, I like the character of Raiden, a lost soul trying to find his true self, but I guess I just wish we would have got to play as Snake again. At least once. At some point. If you can't tell, this is obviously my least favorite of the series, but that doesn't mean it's bad. It's kind of like burnt bacon. 
Yeah, it's a little rough around the edges, but it's still fucking bacon. Overall, a great game. Now, the story might not compare to the rest of the series, but its creepiness definitely makes up for it. The developer Ghost Easter Eggs return in this game, thus starting a tradition that will remain with the series for the most part. In the tanker chapter, as you're getting ready to take pictures of Metal Gear Ray, if you snap a shot at one of the two projection screens, you're liable to catch a glimpse of a ghostly Hideo Kojima. Note, this must be done in the room with the two projectors. Knowing of Kojima like I do now, I find it funny if anything. But when I was a kid and just randomly took a picture and saw this, I was pretty freaked out. I should note, this was before I knew about the ghost of Shadow Moses from the first game. So, imagine accidentally stumbling onto this picture without any context whatsoever. Now, the story might not compare to the rest of the series, but its creepiness definitely makes up for it. The tale must be told. I guess there is one other little creepy moment, but I wanted to save it for last. I know I've already spoiled a lot, but this is a major spoiler alert considering this is so close to the end of the game. So if you want to play the game for yourself and form your own opinions on it, then I suggest you skip this part. Okay. So as I said earlier, Raiden was sent on a mission by who we suspect to be Colonel Roy Campbell. Towards the end of the game, you begin to notice the Colonel's voice distort slightly. Then out of nowhere, you receive these eerie transmissions. Raiden, do you copy? You must continue your m mission Colonel, are you under orders from the Patriots? Your role... That is, mission, is to infiltrate the structure and disarm the terrorists. My role? Why do you keep saying that? Why not? This is a type of role-playing game. Colonel, I just remembered something. What? That I've never met you in person. Not once. Hmm. Complete your mission according to the simulation. Colonel, who are you? No more questions. We have Rosemary. What do you mean by that? Over and out. Raiden, turn the game console off right now. What did you say? The mission is a failure. Cut the power right now. What's wrong with you? Don't worry, it's a game. It's a game just like usual. I hear it's amazing when the famous purple stuffed worm in Flapjaw space with the tuning fork does a raw blink on Harry Carey Rock. I need scissors. 61. Honestly, though, you have played the game for a long time. Don't you have anything else to do with your time? You got a PSG-1? You can use that against Sniper Wolf. Hurry up and save Meryl. Hurry and save him before the terrorists discover his code. Just another perfect example of the series breaking the fourth wall. Big spoilers, but I won't lie, I'm man enough to admit it, I really thought I was supposed to turn off the game. I know, I'm a dumbass. It was just another way for Kojima to screw with our heads. I think I speak for the creepy community when I say how disappointing it was when we heard that the Kojima produced Silent Hill game got cancelled. If he did this in a non-horror title, imagine how much he would have fucked with us in Silent Hills. Anyway, I won't start that rant again. So go play Metal Gear Solid 2 if you haven't already. Or don't. I really don't give a fuck. Like I said, it was my least favorite of the series, but still a good game. I think it's more or less the games that followed it tended to overshadow this entry. Regardless if it was my favorite entry or not, looking back, the creepiness was pretty strong in this game. 
The S3 plan virtual reality plot was disturbing as hell and much like Psycho Vanus, it was another great way for the franchise to break the fourth wall. Speaking of which, this episode was actually part of a larger series of episodes, five to be exact. But unfortunately, due to unresolved copyright issues with Konami, this was the only episode I could release. So I figured one episode was better than zero episodes. I hope to show you the rest of the creepy gaming Metal Gear Solid series someday, but for now, they will remain as lost episodes. Somebody go write a creepy pasta about it or something. I'll be sure to make it up to you next time. Either way, because of the ghostly Hideo Kojima and the eerie S3 VR plot twist, Metal Gear Solid will forever go down in creepy gaming history. I think that's going to do it for me today, folks. I want to thank you all so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed. I am Mullet Mike with the pedal and full screen saying creepy. Stay creepy. Thanks for watching. Peace. And the sorrow. Like you, I too am filled with sadness. This world is one of sadness. Battle brings death. Death brings sorrow. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, freaks and geeks, trolls and derps alike, welcome. Welcome all. I am Mullet Mike with the Battle Gaming Network, bringing you Creepy Gaming. Not just Creepy Gaming, but yet another Creepy Gaming special. And today we will be covering one of my favorite games of the series, Metal Gear Solid 3 Snake Eater. Now I've got a lot to say about this game, so I'm not going to waste your time here. Let's just go ahead and get this started because there's a lot more to go. Turn the lights out of the volume as we journey into some creepy gaming. getting to the good stuff. Today we will be discussing one of the creepiest moments in the entire Metal Gear Solid saga. Today we will be talking about Metal Gear Solid 3 and the River of Sorrow. Okay, this seems to be where the series gets polarizing, more so than the second title even. There were a lot of new game mechanics in Snake Eater, like hunting and a ton of new equipment, like the revival pill lodged in your tooth. Metal Gear Solid 3 Snake Eater was released on the PS2 to a mixed response. The title sold well, but not as well as previous installments. You typically either love this game or hate this game, and I won't bury the lead, I fucking love it! This title definitely rejuvenated my love for Metal Gear Solid, and if you want to play through the series but don't know where to begin, then I suggest Snake Eater as a good starting point. That's mainly because the game is, in fact, a prequel, and is the first game in chronological order. And I would suggest the Metal Gear Solid HD collection, because you get Metal Gear Solid 2, 3, Peace Walkers, and the original Metal Gears. After the mixed response Metal Gear Solid 2 got, series creator Hideo Kojima wanted to take the franchise back to its roots. And I mean way back. The game takes place in the jungles of Russia during the 1960s during the height of the Cold War. Survival elements have been brought back with the addition of a few new ones as well. Again, if you want to play or replay the series for yourself, this is a great starting point. Okay, that being said, it's time to get to the scariness that is the sorrow. I gotta do a little story time, so spoiler alert if you haven't played it and still want to. And don't worry, I'll try to be as quick as I can, seeing as I want to get to the creepiness just as bad as you do. Okay. 
In this game, we play a snake, but not Solid Snake. I'm talking about the OG, the real snake, codenamed Naked Snake, later to be known as the Big Boss. That's right, the father of Solid Liquid and Solid as Snake. Getting to return and have the chance to play his own father, writer, director, and talented voice actor David Hayter provides the voice of Naked Snake. Being an origin story, this is one of the most important entries in the series. In this game alone, we are introduced to such pivotal characters such as the boss, Major Zero, Eva, a young ocelot. It's a proverbial who's who of Metal Gear staple characters. This game is pretty much what you would expect from a Metal Gear game. Snake is sent on a secret mission, and you have to save Russian scientist Sokolov, fighting your way through a colorful cast of bosses. People get betrayed, double-crossed, some even get triple-crossed, and of course you must eventually fight a Metal Gear-like machine, the Shanglehod, the first of its kind. What makes Metal Gear Solid 3 stand out to me, though, is its story and characters. Okay, like I said, I'm trying to be quick about this. Naked Snake is sent to Russia to save Sokolov in what is known as Virtuous Mission. He is aided by Major Zero, who will become one of the series' more pivotal characters, a paramedic who goes by the name, well, paramedic, and the original Snake's former mentor, the boss. In Kojima's rewritten history, the boss is considered the mother of special forces, and it is said that her and Snake develop CQC, or close quarters combat. During Virtuous Mission, the boss betrays you and defects to the Soviet Union, bringing along her team, the Cobras. She tells Snake that he is not welcome and can't come. Colonel Volgan, the boss's new ally, shoots a Davy Crockett nuke on a Soviet research facility, thus causing a major international incident. U.S. President Johnson has a private conversation with Soviet leader Khrushchev, where he tells President that the U.S. must prove their innocence. Whew! Fuck! And that's just the opening. Literally. The opening credits don't roll until after what I just told you. That's when you know you're in for something epic. It is then agreed that Snake will return to the Soviet jungles, meet with agents Adam and Eva, rescue Russian scientist Sokolov, eliminate the Cobra unit, destroy the Shanglehod, and inevitably kill his friend and mentor, the boss. Now, with all of that finally being said, I can get to the creepy stuff. I know some people complain and say the creepy stuff is never usually until halfway through the video. Well, I just like to help people who aren't familiar with the series and give players who are some context. I'm sorry. In this case, especially, putting it into context really makes it that much creepier. You'll see why. It has become a staple of the series now over the years for the Metal Gear Solid games to have a colorful cast of bosses to battle with. The Cobra unit is no exception. Here's where the more fantastical elements come into play. The boss's Cobra unit is made up of the fury, the pain, the fear, the end, and the sorrow. Although he's never really seen with the rest of the unit. All have some sort of special ability. For example, the pain can control swarms of hornets to attack his enemies. The end is a really, really, really old sniper who is one with nature. And the sorrow, well, the sorrow is something else. Later in the game, Snake is trying to escape Ocelot and his Gru soldiers. After being beaten, tortured, and even losing his eye, Snake knows he has no other choice but to take a leap of faith and hope for the best. When landing in the water below, Snake is knocked unconscious. What happens next is one of the weirdest, strangest, most frightening boss battles I've ever been a part of. To be honest, I'm really surprised I didn't get more requests for this, and for those who did suggest it and I just didn't see it, I am so sorry. I would have covered this so much sooner. Snake awakens in what I call the River of Sorrow. You will see ghostly apparitions floating around you, taunting you, almost teasing you. This is where it gets interesting. Depending on how you play determines on what you may or may not see in the River of Sorrow, but basically you will be faced with every life you have taken in the game thus far. And for me, that was quite a few. As you slowly walk down the creek of the damned, former enemies will grab at you, moaning in pain. It's one of the creepiest, most unexpected scenes I've ever witnessed in a video game. 
While walking, the sorrow might occasionally jump scare you unexpectedly. If you're lucky enough, you can actually dodge the jump scares completely. Once you reach the end, you'll see the floating body of the sorrow. If you touch him, you die. But this is where it gets even crazier. You are supposed to die. Remember the revival pill that I mentioned earlier? Yeah, you use that. This is just another way for Kojima to make players think outside of the box. Well done. Golf clap. Still not creepy enough for you? Well, after the battle, Snake revives underneath the waterfall he jumped from. Paramedic reveals that they were afraid they lost you. It is then revealed by Snake's team that the sorrow has been dead for years. This explains why he is never seen with the rest of the Cobra unit. Not just that, but you might catch glimpses of him throughout the rest of the game. He was once the boss's lover, and in a strange parallel, she was the one that was ordered to kill him, much like Snake's mission is to kill the boss. Overall, great storytelling and a chilling boss fight that will stick with me until that day I walk down the river of sorrow myself. I am lightning. The rain has formed. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, Mullet Mike here with the <laughs> Paddle, bringing you Creepy Gaming Metal Gear Solid 4. Metal Gear Solid 4. Metal Gear Solid 4. Because that is exactly what we are covering today. I don't want to spoil too much, I don't want to say too much, I don't want to repeat myself too much. I've been waiting to bring this episode to you guys, so I truly hope you enjoy. Without any further ado, turn the lights down and the volume up as we journey into some creepy gaming. I'm so excited as Metal Gear Solid 4. Metal Gear Solid 4, probably my favorite game of the series. When I first played, I was speechless. The game looked gorgeous and unlike anything I had seen up until that time. Some players complained that there was too much story and not enough gameplay. Well, I must respectfully disagree, while yes, there are some pretty long cutscenes, up to an hour if I'm not mistaken, probably longer. Myself and many others enjoyed the game because of the story. To me, it does what all great games do. It makes you want to play more and more to see what's going to happen next. In this installment, guess what? We actually get to play as Solid Snake. Holy shit! Solid, buddy. It's been too long. So how's it been going? Has it been good? Probably not. You go through a lot of shit, it seems like. Had a little tougher life. Maybe that's why you've aged a little bit faster, you know? You're looking good, though. Really? No, really, what's your secret? No, come on, really? Pfft, you're full of shit, old snake. Yeah, Solid is now referred to as Old Snake. It is revealed that the clones of Big Boss were injected with an advanced aging serum. We know this because Guns of the Patriots only takes place five years after the events of Sons of Liberty. Not just that, but we learn that the clones cannot reproduce either. 
So in this installment, we join Old Snake battling his premature aging for one last mission to once and for all bring down the Patriots. Ocelot once again returns, this time as the main antagonist, but because Liquid Snake has taken over, this character is now officially referred to, you guessed it, as Liquid Ocelot. More like Liquid Awesome Lot. This is one of the toughest, most diabolical characters in the series and makes the tension in the game grow to new heights. You gotta think, he has the mind of Liquid Snake and the CQC skills of Ocelot. I mean, have you seen this guy with a revolver? Holy shit! What a diabolical combo! Besides Liquid Ocelot, other series mainstays return, such as Otacon, Merrill, Roy Campbell, Mei Ling, Vamp, Sunny, which is the daughter of Olga, Rose, Eva, and even Raiden returns as a cyborg ninja, much like Gray Fox did. To me, these well-written characters and the driving storylines make this installment stand out against the rest. On to the creepiness, and this game does not disappoint in that department. In the beginning, we are introduced to the Metal Gear Geckos. These smaller, more logistical versions of Metal Gear have a truly eerie introduction. What? Between their strange cries, uncanny mobility, and human tissue-like legs, the geckos are strange, creepy, and overall, they can just be very nerve-wracking, adding to the game's already high tension. Another staple of the series reemerges when you return to Shadow Moses and discover the ghosts that still haunt the abandoned facility. Just like the first game, taking pictures will reveal the ghosts of Shadow Moses. This time, though, rather than just seeing, Snake must also hear the ghosts of his past. Next up, let's talk about this title's bosses. Falling in the Metal Gear Solid tradition, all the bosses follow a theme. Metal Gear Solid 4 is no exception. Old Snake learns of the B.O.B.s. It stands for Beauty or Beasts. But this group of disturbing vixens are more commonly known as the deadly beauties. You want to talk about creepy? These dangerous sirens appear in two forms, monstrous grotesque figures before they shed their armor revealing that they are really these twisted yet stunning ladies. Their monstrous forms are utterly disturbing, but I am having a harder time figuring out which form is creepier, the beauty or the beast. Once in beauty form, if they catch you, Snake ends up in the White Room. And yes, it is exactly as weird as it sounds. The deadly beauties include that of Laughing Octopus, Raging Raven, Crying Wolf, and last, but most certainly not least, Screaming Mantis. Sound familiar? All the Deadly Beauties are extremely disturbing in their beast forms, especially the likes of Laughing Octopus, and I'll say again, Screaming Mantis. Okay, minor spoiler alert if you didn't pick up on my hints, but Psycho Mantis totally makes a nice cameo and returns in ghostly form as a puppet master as he always does. His appearance in 4, though, is sadly much more comedic compared to his first. Apparently, he tries to read your memory card only to realize that the PS3 has built-in memory storage. It's a nice callback. 
The world presented to us in Metal Gear Solid 4 can be seen as terrifying, but what's even more disturbing to me is the correlations I see between the real world and the world that Kojima has presented to us. Again, the series is centered around drone-like unmanned vehicles throughout various war-torn countries. It sounds eerily too familiar. Overall though, Metal Gear Solid 4 is a great game. Again, probably my favorite of the series. It's between 4 or Snake Eater. With the intriguing characters, the various locations, the driving storylines, and all the freaking creepiness, Metal Gear Solid has done more than enough to earn its place in both gaming history and creepy gaming history alike. That's going to do it for me today, folks. I hope you all enjoyed. Thank you all so much for watching. I am Mullet Mike saying, Thank you, stay creepy. Thanks for watching. Peace. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, freaks and geeks, trolls and derps alike, welcome. Welcome all. I am none other than Mullet Mike with the Paddle Gaming Network bringing you creepy gaming. Don't act surprised. I'm sure as hell not. Of course we're going to be covering Five Nights at Freddy's 4 for the season finale. It only makes sense. I've gotten a ton of requests for this, and as a matter of fact, I would like to say a special shout out to all these fine folks right here. Thank you all so much for your suggestions and support. Because of you, you've actually topped last season's record and made this the most highly requested episode to date. I feel like I've already talked until I was blue in the face about Five Nights at Freddy's, but game creator Scott Cawthon thought we should have another installment. So here we go. And for those wondering who did request, the only reason I've waited as long as I have is simply because I wanted to wait till the Halloween DLC was out so I can review that as well. So without any further ado, turn the lights down and the volume up as we journey into some more fucking Freddy's. God help us. Five Nights at... Oh, fuck! Here we go again! Five Nights at Freddy's 4. Let's face it, you either love it or hate it. I can't remember the last time I've seen such a popular franchise be so polarizing. Oh, wait. I know a lot of people loathe this series at this point, but understand that I again have had a lot of requests for this, so I can't just ignore that part of my audience. So if you ask for it, this one's for you guys. The fourth installment of creator Scott Cawthon's survival horror series was originally scheduled for release in October for Halloween. But as per usual, the enigmatic developer released it early as he did with the other sequels. Real quick for those unaware, Five Nights at Freddy's is about a group of creepy animatronics who, over the course of the games, we learn more about as the lore continues to build. That's the simplest way I know how to put it. But chances are, if you're watching this, then you already know. Shortly after the release of Five Nights at Freddy's 3, series creator Scott Cawthon began teasing a follow-up with a series of images on his website, scottgames.com. Each image depicted a different animatronic with the phrase, Was it me? Now, while I admittedly had a lot of questions following FNAF 3, one question stuck out to me more than others. What about the bite of 87? It was a major plot point in the first two games, but omitted from the third entirely. So basically, when I saw the rhetorical question of was it me, I got excited because I thought just maybe we will get some answers. Then it happened. It was officially announced. Five Nights at Freddy's 4. The final chapter. The final chapter? Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute! How are you gonna make a game called Five Nights at Freddy's and only make four games? It doesn't add up, Scott! What are you doing here? Oh, wait a minute, FNAF World. 
That'd be a fifth game, wouldn't it? Okay. Well, you know, that makes sense. Never mind. When I saw it said the final chapter, I creamed my khakis. Maybe. Finally. Now. After all the theories and easter eggs and meaningless references, maybe now we will get all the answers we've been waiting for. Well, let's talk about the game and we'll get into that. I should note, I do find it strange that the words the final chapter are nowhere to be seen on the game's title screen. The premise is fairly simple. Basically, you're a twitchy little kid who's hopped up on either Mountain Dew or Adderall who stays up all night frantically running back and forth from door to door to keep the monsters that may or may not exist in his head at bay. Yeah, that really kind of sums it all up. Stay creepy. Thanks for watching. Peace. In all seriousness, it's nice to once again see the change in dynamic and gameplay. Like I said, the addition of running rather than just sitting in a stationary position was a nice change up. It's funny how the smallest differences can really add a new level to the game's already established framework. Unlike previous installments, we are not greeted by the phone guy. Either of them. As a matter of fact, I don't think there's a single word of spoken dialogue in the game, if I'm not mistaken. Rather than setting the tone like in the previous games, you were left to figure out the plot on your own. I'll admit, I went into this game blind without seeing any playthrough, and it was intimidating as fuck. The fear of the unknown is fear in one of its finest forms. The fear of jump scares, on the other hand, is weak and overused, but in all fairness, the anticipation of a jump scare creates, I'd say, more tension than terror. As I bluntly stated earlier, you play as what we assume to be a young boy, terrified of the hellish, soul-sucking animatronics of Fred Bear's Pizza. I don't blame you, kid. I was right there with you. Ugh. The game opens up with a golden Fred Bear talking to this young child. We find that the kid is locked in his room by who we find out later to be an abusive sibling. Now is this the same kid we play as during the night stages too? I don't know for sure, but I'm assuming so at this point. The child refers to his plushies as his friends. So yeah, either this kid is schizophrenic or this Golden Freddy is really talking to him. Either way, pretty fucked up. I thought the last game took a darker tone, but I'll give credit where credit is due. This game is just as dark. This installment will be easier to explain than others, mainly because there's no phone guy exposition, and really nights one through four are basically the same, just with higher difficulty. So rather than working in a pizza place or a haunted attraction, we've established that you play as a young boy trying to make it through the hours of 12 p.m. to 6 a.m. The gameplay is built off of the sound design, I'd say more so than previous installments. You must go to each door and either ward off the nightmare animatronics by either shining a flashlight or shutting the door if you hear their breathing. Speaking of which, MAJOR creepy points to the nightmare designs of the animatronics. These are probably some of my favorites. They just look so evil and almost demonic in nature. If this kid is really just having some sort of nightmare or hallucination, it makes sense for them to look more dastardly than their real-life counterparts. I will give the game this. It did remind me of being a little kid, afraid at night, constantly checking under my bed for ghosts and goblins. Kudos. Well played. Thank you for reminding me of a repressed memory of my already ruined childhood. Greatly appreciated. Back to the gameplay, the core mechanics of the traditional FNAF gameplay remains. You must keep the monsters at bay. Simple enough, right? Nights 1 through 4, you must avoid Nightmare Bonnie and Nightmare Chica. Nightmare Foxy shows up on night 2 in your closet, which is reminiscent of the Pirate Bay setup, as if Foxy was peering from behind the curtain. On your bed, you will see a traditional Freddy doll, but that's not all. You'll find while checking doors, you may hear Velociraptor-like screams. These would be the Nightmare Freddy plushies that pop out of your bed. Out of context, this has to sound really fucked up. 
Throughout each night, the difficulty grows more and more to a point of where you are juggling monkeys and chainsaws trying to keep the animatronics at bay. Oh, I should mention that the cupcake returns on these nights too, as a wicked nightmare version. Nights 1 through 4 can be pretty simple once you learn how to balance the doors, closet, and bed. Night 5 and onward is a different story entirely. On night 5, we are introduced to Nightmare Fredbear. This has got to be one of the most horrifying animatronic designs yet. Not just that, but the rules that applied on the first four nights no longer matter. Rather than just opening a door and listening for breathing, you must shine your flashlight and shut the door immediately. It's a nice change of formula mid-game to keep you on your toes. Now, I'm not even going to act surprised. We all knew there was going to be a night six. That's just how these games go. It's even its own playable feature on the main menu, and I know why. The sixth night is probably the most fun stage to play, in my opinion. It starts out with medium difficulty and you warding off Nightmare Chica, Bonnie, Cupcake, Foxy, and the Fredheads. At the stroke, yeah I said stroke, of 2am, all bets are off. Nightmare Fredbear comes out and the gameplay formula changes mid-level. It was a nice surprise. Next up is Nightmare Night 7, and we are introduced to an entirely new character, aptly named Nightmare. That's it. Just Nightmare. This shadow version of Golden Fredbear is somehow even more terrifying if that's even possible. It plays just like Night 5, just with a little bit higher difficulty and an all-new jump scare. So, rather than this... We now get this. Just when you thought Nightmare couldn't get any creepier. I will give it this credit, the jump scare itself felt like a nice callback to the original Golden Freddy jump scare from the first game. It's funny how this simplistic in nature jump scare can have such an effect. If you notice, it's just a still image. To me, the strange sounds is what makes it so creepy. All of this culminates once finishing the main game. We see what we believe to be the bite of 87. Although there is a lot of speculation around that. We'll get to that. Anyways, watch the clip. <laughs> While a terrifying notion, I'll admit, did it have to be so funny? Was this intentional? I mean, look at the bullies' faces! <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't mean to laugh at this poor kid. This little guy was just fed to a Fredbear animatronic. But considering Cawthon's sense of humor in these games, I'm calling this one intentional. Other than the few humorous parts, overall, this game was dark and gritty. And depressing. More questions were answered and enough new gameplay mechanics were added to make it feel fresh. I know a lot of people are tired of the series or just don't like it because it's everywhere, but I still do. One thing I've realized about other horror games is that they lack replay value. Not just that, but they lack a nice payoff as well. That's one aspect I will credit Five Nights at Freddy's for. The game has a great replay value and is just challenging enough that it makes you want to continue. Yeah, you get frustrated and pissed off, but you keep playing. You want to reach the end. Well done, Cawthon. You did it again. If this is indeed the final chapter of the Five Nights at Freddy's franchise, then I think this was a good, solid way to go out. But I doubt it is. I guess only time will tell. 
Now, I know there's a lot more to cover, such as the mysteriously locked case, the purple guy, theories, easter eggs, Halloween DLC, and even FNAF World. And don't worry, we will cover it all. But speaking for the core game alone, Five Nights at Freddy's 4 has done more than enough to go down in creepy gaming history. So join me next time in part two when we will be discussing the Halloween DLC for Five Nights at Freddy's 4 and briefly talk about FNAF World. Then for part three, what you've all been waiting for, we will discuss Five Nights at Freddy's 4 secrets, theories, and Easter eggs. I hope you enjoy and I hope you're ready for Freddy because there's a lot more to come. That's going to do it for me today. Folks, I want to thank you all so much for watching. Hi, I'm Mullen Mike with Keep it sticky, stay creepy. Thanks for watching. Peace. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, freaks and geeks, trolls and derps alike, welcome, welcome all. I am Mullet Mike with the Sticky Pedal Gaming Network and Full Screen, bringing you Creepy Gaming. All right, so if you've been joining us this month, then you know we've been covering Five Nights at Freddy's 4. Well, because there was so much to talk about, I felt like I would leave this as its own separate episode. Because today, we will be talking about none other than Five Nights at Freddy's Halloween Edition DLC. And then we might also briefly talk about the upcoming FNAF world while we're at it. Alright, I don't really know what else to say. I guess without any further ado, let's turn the lights down and the volume up as we journey into some creepy game. Now, I should probably start out by saying the game's creator, Scott Cawthon, has went on record stating that the Halloween DLC is non-canon. So, basically, none of this changes or affects the game's lore. That being said, I just wanted to quickly point out the differences between the core game and its Halloween DLC. At first, I was expecting some basic seasonal cosmetic changes, and that's what it is, really, but... I was thinking more along the lines of Angry Bird Seasons. So needless to say, I was pleasantly surprised that besides cosmetic differences, that there were actual changes to gameplay mechanics as well. The differences in this game are just flat out terrifying. I was already afraid of the animatronics from the original game, but the jack-o'-lantern versions are absolutely frightening. Jacko Bonnie and Jacko Chica will be the first you encounter, just like Night 1 of FNAF 4. So when I started Night 2, I was anticipating a Jacko Foxy. That would be a safe assumption, right? This is where one of the biggest differences occur. On Night 2, we begin hearing the eerily familiar sound of static. Could it be? No. Is it? <laughs> yep, it's Mangle. I've stated in the past how Mangle has always been one of the more frightening animatronics of the series, in my opinion. So, now we need a nightmare version! There, that's better. Not just that, but this probably explains why we've seen Mangle in the other room in the original version. Regardless if it's canon or not, it just makes sense. This is where we see a real difference in the gameplay. Like we've talked about, FNAF 4 is based around sound design. Some sounds can be ambient, but noises, breathing, and footsteps are essential to listen for. Now try listening to the other animatronics with this in the background. Another one of the bigger changes in the Halloween edition is when you begin Nightmare Night 7. You immediately hear the creepy sound of an all too familiar music box. I don't know what that sound is, but that can't be good. That's right. Rather than Nightmare, you must deal with the puppet. I should note, this is not the same smiling puppet that we've all grown to love, but of course a creepy 8 foot tall nightmare version! 
In the Halloween edition, he is referred to as Nightmarionette, which is obviously a mix of the words Nightmare and Marionette, which he was originally called according to the second game's files. Special thanks to staff member Nico Run from Deep Game Research for digging into these games for me. He's helped a lot with all of the FNAF episodes. That being said, Nightmare Night 7 Halloween Edition has to be by far one of the most difficult nights in either version of the game. Maybe it was just me, but I had some trouble with Nightmare A. The Halloween Edition also features new cheats, new challenge modes such as Blindfold and Nightmare, nice additional features for it to be free downloadable content. The last difference I'd like to talk about is definitely one of the creepiest. In the original version of FNAF 4, we had a fun with plush trap minigame. Well, now we have fun with balloon- yeah! That's not Balloon Boy! Oh right, Nightmare Version. It's not like Balloon Boy wasn't creepy enough. It's not like any of the animatronics were creepy enough. I know! Let's make Nightmare Versions! All I have to say is holy shit. Nightmare Balloon Boy made me Shatner myself, okay? I'm shamelessly not afraid to admit it. Other than a few cosmetic changes in the Segway scenes, the rest is pretty much the same. Whether or not the game's differences are canon, it really doesn't matter. If anything, I appreciate Scott Cawthon for telling us it's non-canon right off the bat rather than everyone going crazy and trying to figure out what it all means. Overall, I enjoyed the Halloween edition. The fact that it was free DLC didn't hurt either. Now, I wasn't originally going to talk about this, but since the first trailer has been released, I might as well touch on it briefly. FNAF World, or Five Nights at Freddy's World. I don't really know yet how the official title will be pronounced. As I've mentioned before in the previous episode, Scott Cawthon claims he is done with the Five Nights at Freddy's series, for now, and wanted to move on to something else. Well, kinda. After the initial release of FNAF 4, ScottGames.com released a commemorative thank you picture featuring the entire cast up until that point. Slowly as the months rolled on, certain characters began to get switched out with these cutesy cartoon versions. No one really knew what to make of it, until finally the new image was complete and thank you had been replaced with FNAF World. Now, since the trailer's release, it has been getting mixed responses. I feel like I'm one of the few who actually likes the new approach that's being taken. Scott has created all of these characters, and I guess he wants to move on from horror. For now. And I commend him for that. Do what makes you happy. This just being a teaser trailer, it should be noted that this footage is far from finished gameplay, so who knows, it might not even look anything like this when it comes out. Just from what I gather from the footage, it looks like some sort of turn-based RPG, just with FNAF characters. In a strange, nostalgic way, it almost reminds me of Super Mario RPG. It's a turn-based RPG with characters we've grown to love. I swear, I will find every excuse to show that clip. That being said, the Five Nights at Freddy's series has already done more than enough to make its way into creepy gaming history, but between FNAF World and Five Nights at Freddy's 4 Halloween Edition, it's definitely helped cement the game's legacy. Well, that wraps it up for Five Nights at Freddy's Halloween Edition, that wraps it up for FNAF World, but Join me next time in the season five finale of Creepy Gaming when we discuss what everybody's all been waiting for. Five Nights at Freddy's, secrets, theories, and Easter eggs. You're damn right. That's gonna do it for me today, folks. I wanna thank you all so much for watching. Hi, I'm Mother Mike with the on full screen saying creepy. Stay creepy. Thanks for watching. Peace. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, freaks and geeks, trolls and derps alike. Welcome. Welcome all. I am Mullet Mike. With us.
Paddle Gaming Network and Full Screen, bringing you the season finale of Creepy Gaming. That's right, folks. All good things must unfortunately come to an end. But I figured what better way to go out, what bigger bang to blow up on than Five Nights at Freddy's 4. That being said, we've already covered the initial game. We have covered the Five Nights at Freddy's 4 Halloween DLC. We've even briefly talked about FNAF World. But today, it's the show you've all been waiting for. Today, we will be covering none other than secrets, theories, and Easter eggs from Five Nights at Freddy's 4. Without any further ado, turn the lights down and the volume up as we journey into some creepy gaming. Alright, it's time to get to the main course of this mill, so let's dig right in. As usual, I am not claiming in any way that this is all of the secrets, theories, and easter eggs of the series, but rather a mixture of the most discussed and my personal favorites. So let's start with a creepy easter egg and all the theories that surround it. One of the more discussed and more fascinating easter eggs of the game can be found in the child's room while playing. Occasionally, when turning around to look at the bed, you may see one of three things. Either flowers, a prescription pill bottle, or even an IV drip. These easter eggs have led to a ton of speculation. There are many theories as to what these items could possibly mean. As I mentioned in my first Five Nights at Freddy's 4 episode, we don't even know for sure if this is the same kid we see in the Segway scenes between nights. We assume it is, but we don't know for sure. If you want to get technical and get into semantics, which is what we do here on this show, then you'll notice that the child's room in the Segway scene only has one door, whereas the kid's room here has two. Not just that, but where are his plushies? You know, his friends. All we see at night is the plush Freddy, while in the Segway scenes he has a golden Fredbear. Huh. Now, when I first played, I just assumed this was the same child, until I realized the room layout was different. This is where it gets more bizarre. Maybe it is the same kid. We just might not be playing the nights leading up to the party as we originally thought, but rather afterwards. Allow me to explain. There's been an interesting theory going around that we are, in fact, playing as the same young boy, but after the incident, and that you're really on your deathbed. We know the boy was already afraid of the animatronics as it was, but once bitten, he sees them as he remembers them, as nightmarish monsters. Or the poor kid's just seeing shit as some sort of dying hallucination. Spoilers, but if you look at the ending of Five Nights at Freddy's 4, we assume the child eventually dies. So, were we playing the last week of his life? If this theory is in fact true, then it would explain why at times we see the IV bag or the medication on his nightstand. The flowers would be a customary get well soon gift, or even a new stuffed teddy bear. Sounds like it could be a plausible theory. But what do you guys think? You tell me. So this Easter egg can be easy to miss, but between nights two and three, you were in a Fred Bear's pizzeria. You were supposed to walk to the left. But if you turn back around immediately, you will see the purple guy assisting someone in a bonnie suit. Many players, myself included, found this to be interesting. To me, this says that the purple guy, who we associate with the killer from the previous games, was in fact a Fazbear employee. There has been a theory going around for well over a year now that the purple guy and the phone guy were actually one and the same. 
This may further prove that theory. This isn't really an easter egg as much as it is a follow up. More of a nod than anything. Last year when I covered the first Five Nights at Freddy's, there was a theory regarding the ominous cupcake. Why? I have no idea. Anything can be picked apart in these games. So whether it was planned from the beginning or Scott Cawthon just wanted to add it because of all the fuss, in this game, the cupcake does appear for the first time as an attacking animatronic. Probably the most debated of all the easter eggs and theories would be that of the TV ad. Between nights 3 and 4, the young boy must walk home from Fredbear's. Upon arrival, if you go to the TV, a commercial will begin to play showing Fredbear and Friends, copyright 1983. So it's possible what we thought was the bite of 87 might not be after all. Personally, I don't know. I could see both sides to the debate, but I'll admit the timeline confuses me in this game. This is supposed to be around the time of the first restaurant, Fred Bear's Family Diner. I was under the impression that the only two animatronics there were Fred Bear and Golden Bonnie, which makes sense because in the game we only see the two in the actual diner. My question though is why are we seeing all the other animatronics? Maybe I misunderstood something with the original characters. Maybe Foxy and Chicka were around or something. But that is no excuse for Toy Bonnie. Why do we see Toy Bonnie everywhere in this game? The young girl in the field with her toys. Even the mysterious commercial we see. Toy Bonnie! Again, maybe I'm missing something really big. But I didn't think the toy versions of the animatronics were made until 1987. Wasn't that like half of the plot of the second game? The grand reopening? The new toy animatronics? If I'm missing something, please let me know. Again, I see both sides. I could see how many think it's the bite of 87, and I could see how, because of the copyright date, some think it to be a separate bite entirely. Personally speaking, just my humble opinion, I don't know. I can't help but feel this is a red herring from Cawthon to throw everyone off. Just because the commercial says 1983 doesn't mean that was the year it aired. Maybe, just maybe, they copyrighted the name four years prior when the company started. Maybe they were advertising a new location with new toy animatronics. Here's my last argument and then you can fight amongst yourselves in the comment section. Why wouldn't this be the bite of 87? It's never been fully addressed. Besides, if this really is the final chapter, which I doubt, why would Scott Cawthon create an entirely new story arc? It just doesn't make sense to have two bites. Toy Bonnie is the key that proves that this game does, in fact, take place in 1987. Boom! There's my case. You can't see it right now, but I'm totally dropping the mic. Alright, the last thing I want to do right now is to make a lame, overused, what's in the box joke. That reference is in fact nearly 20 years old now, and seeing as this game has been out for months, I'm sure it's been used. That out of the way, let's discuss the strange box at the end of the game. At this point, we should all know about the box. There are two locks, and as of right now, no way of opening them. The text above it reads, Perhaps some things are best left forgotten. For now. To me, if this really is the final chapter, then this is a fitting end, and allow me to explain why. Go back and watch my first Five Nights at Freddy's videos. I've been saying it for a while now. Scott Cawthon has always given the players room to speculate. That's the magic of the series. Each game, Scott has raised new questions without giving definitive answers, leaving room for theories and speculation. 
something I think has truly attributed to the game's popularity. This installment finally wraps it up, for the most part, while still being vague enough to question. Think about it for a second. Whether we realize it or not, the story arc of the five missing kids was explained in the last game, the purple guy was revealed to be an employee and eventually the killer, we learned in the last game that the marionette was the one who placed the kids in the original animatronics, and as far as I'm concerned, we saw the events that surrounded the Bite of 87. The main storylines are wrapped up. Now, sure, there are many cryptic aspects that we can tear apart and over-examine, but we finally got some closure. Or at least as much closure as I think we're gonna get. For now. The box is Scott's way of leaving with one last trick up his sleeve. If he decides to never come back to the series, then it's left open-ended. And I assure you, whatever you imagine is in that box is better than what was intended. Again, that's part of the magic, and like any good magician, you never reveal all of your tricks. If Scott does decide one day to return to the series, then he's got somewhere to go. Another smart move on his part. So with all of that being said, yeah! Whether you like it or not, Five Nights at Freddy's has done more than enough to earn its place in creepy gaming history. Well, I guess that's gonna do it, folks. I think that does it for season five of Creepy Gaming. It's been a fun ride, but again, all good things must come to an end. I wanna thank you all so much, everybody. If you just started watching this week, if you've been watching years ago since season one, I would like to thank everybody for watching and supporting season five of Creepy Gaming. It means a lot to me, it means a lot to my family. So it is greatly appreciated. Most importantly, guys, enjoy your time with friends and family. That's what this is all about. As far as me and season five of Creepy Gaming goes, I think that's gonna do it for us today, folks. I wanna thank you all so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed. I am Mullen Mike with <laughs> Paddle saying keep Stay creepy. Thank you all for watching. Peace.